What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, so we are finally covering Infinity, or at least starting to cover Infinity. This is a big story. This is this is a pretty huge story, and it's amazing. We're gonna cover this and then bookend into Infinity Gauntlet Part Eight, uh, Thanos Quest Parts One and Two, and then the lead up to Thanos Quest. So technically, we're kind of doing this out of chronological order. But Infinity is an amazing story. It is it is such a great story. Now this builds on everything we've talked about so far with Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. We kind of took a break from that for a little while. The idea of Avengers and New Avengers is that it dealt with the collapse of the multiverse, right? The Basically the end of all things. This is one of those stories that leads up to that. And it's designed to kind of give us this perspective that like everything's popping off and everybody's really panicking. But initially what this does is it actually picks up with Titan. Now, one thing I also want to preface here, if you are a little bit out of, if you, if you haven't seen those videos, we'll, we'll re, I'll refresh you guys as we go through this. But I would also suggest you guys go back and watch those videos because it'll, it'll help to get you caught up on everything that's going on right now. But we pick up on Titan and what we do is we pick up with an Outrider. Now, now, outriders are genetically modified or really genetically engineered beings that serve a singular purpose and that purpose is whatever whims and wants their masters want and so what we end up doing is picking up with Corvus Glaive now right off the bat we're not told this is Corvus Glaive but we know this by virtue of the fact of how he looks and really everybody's kind of looked into him by now because of the Infinity War movie but what's really happening is that this outrider shows up and the questions asked where have you been you know what what have you found and the outrider responds that it found a place called uh, called Alagulo and when the questions asked have you found the gauntlet or is there a tribute, what this indicates is that things are being hunted for in two fashions. This group is looking for the Infinity Gauntlet, or they're looking for a tribute if the Infinity Gauntlet's not offered. And so what this thing basically says is there is no gauntlet there, but there is a tribute that will be offered. And so as a result, the Outriders sent back out again to find another world. And so what we do is we pick up on this planet, Alagulo, with Corvus Glaive himself. And this is what I love about Jonathan Hickman writing. It's basically like, like word spreads when these conquerors return, word spreads of Corvus Glaive. Because remember, Corvus Glaive is hardcore. Now, again, this is really like the first real appearance that he has and notice this this guy is so awesome he shows up and he asks the questions where's Ogalux, the brave your your brave warrior where's this man that will save you from the doom that i'm going to bring to your doorstep and when the question or when the response is given by the king well we don't know corvus glaive simply says i know where he is i know where he is because you sent him to kill me as soon as we got here so not only did i kill him i've destroyed his sword which is a ceremonial weapon for you oh and by the way here's the arm he used to hold it with this is hardcore like they immediately summon the guards, right? Like, you know, the king kind of freaks out, summon the guards, Corvus Glaive's like, I think not, you know, and it's just like, that's not going to happen at all. And so in response, what ends up happening, what we find out is that somewhere along the line, Thanos had shown up on this, on this world and just started like eradicating people, just started obliterating people and put really pushed them to like the brink of extinction. And where there were only a few thousand of them left, what they did is they rebuilt. And so what the alternative is that Corvus Glaive offers, or really the ultimatum he offers is you can give me a pittance or I will eradicate what's left of your people and I will destroy destroy you in your entirety. And so ultimately, they give in. Corvus Glaive travels back to Titan. He basically shows Thanos, here's the tribute you're looking for. And we end up finding out it's the heads of all the children that existed on that planet. And so at this point, we switch back to Earth. We basically follow this outrider as it's running through and as it's trying to find what's going on. I mean, it, it goes from place to place. They can't see it. It's just jumping from person to person, trying to figure out what's going on and trying to find this particular object that it's hunting for. Now, from here, we jump to another point in space. And what we have here are the builders the gardeners and the Alephs. Now, this is Jonathan Hickman's way of retelling the origin of the universe. The issue with this is that this is before Secret Wars in 2015. After Secret Wars in 2015, the origin of the universe was retold yet again by a guy named Al Ewing in the Ultimates line of comics, which you'll find that video uh, video link down in the description. But basically, before Al Ewing told his origin, what this essentially says is that there's basically the builders. They are these beings that are responsible for the creation of all things. Now, again, we talked about this in the New Avengers video that we did before. For. But what basically is established here is that the builders created planets, they created life, everything that exists inside of this universe was created by the builders. They live up to their namesake. Now again, none of what we're seeing here really applies anymore in terms of the role the builders play. That origin has effectively kind of been wiped away. As far as we're aware, they don't really exist anymore. So you can kind of take this for what it's worth. I mean, the role they play is still cool and it still matters in the confines of this story. But in the greater Marvel landscape, it doesn't really matter anymore. So it's just kind of left to whatever it is that you want to follow here. But the idea is that on this 
world that the builders are currently raising and destroying, we have what are called Space Knights. Now, the Space Knights made their appearances back in 1979 with ROM number one, and I do not remember who wrote that story, uh, but they are basically cyborgs. They're not full machines. Instead, what you had was a group called the Dire Race, which we don't really need to get into for this video, but the Space Knights are basically de designed as this sort of interplanetary slash galactic police force to a degree. But the idea is that they were basically beings, humanoid beings at one time, that were converted into these Space Knights, and it's actually an honorable position to take. To offer yourself up and to be accepted and become a Space Knight is one of the highest honors that a humanoid being can achieve in this part of the universe. But with them basically being this more or less Avengers-esque kind of uh, superhero team protecting this world, they're met by the arrival of Captain Universe. Now again, this is all part of that refresher stuff. Captain Universe is, is really more of like a concept that bonds itself to a particular person. It's one of those things where the, the Captain Universe only ever really shows up when the universe is in dire straits. When the universe is in danger, there's some massive threat that like universal power requires. But the whole idea here is that where you have a few beings on this planet who kind of say, look, the Space Knights are here. The Space Knights are going to rescue us. It makes sense because the Space Knights have for the most part been undefeated. It's like the Avengers, right? Like, you know, different members of the Avengers have fallen, but by and large, the larger Avengers roster has always succeeded. The heroes always win. And that's the point of this. The, really, the, the whole collapse of the multiverse story is to answer the question, what happens when the heroes don't win? And in this small confined space, that's what Captain Universe tells these, these people here. Like, sure, you can cheer on the Space Knights all you want to. They're going to die, and so are you. This world's going to be destroyed. And when the question is, why? Then the response is, because the builders are here. And that's when the builders say, let it be as if this planet never was. And everything gets destroyed. The planet's obliterated in its, in, in its entirety. And so what we end up doing here is we transition to a place called the Peak with a group called SWORD. Now, SWORD stands for the Sentient World Observation and Response Department. And we've talked about this a million times before. Where SHIELD exists to monitor Earth explicitly, SWORD exists to monitor space. They basically monitor all these different extraterrestrial races, they keep track of their radio chatter, and they basically keep an eye on things to make sure that no one really becomes a credible threat to Earth. But if in situations like this, an alien race shows up on Earth, then SWORD takes precedence over SHIELD. And the result is that where, where SWORD initially sent in their own agents to deal with this, ultimately they ended up pulling their agents out and they brought the Avengers instead. And when the Avengers show up on the scene, we end up finding out this group of people who were here are scrolls. Now again, scrolls are shapeshifters. That's really kind of the, the big the big claim to fame with them, is they can take on the form of virtually anything they want to. And where the Avengers are able to put them down relatively quickly, they start to notice that something isn't right. Usually whenever the scrolls show up on Earth, they're there as like a war group designed to infiltrate the Earth and then try to take out humanity and take over the Earth. But where Captain America and Hawkeye and these various Avengers look around, what they start to realize is that if this is not a war party, if this is not a scouting party, they're not soldiers of any kind, they look like refugees. And if they're refugees, what are they fleeing from? That's the question that's being asked here. That's, that's the question they're trying to find an answer to. And so picking back up with this outrider that basically take, that, that shows up on the city of Attilan, as it goes through and starts to read the mind of Black Bolt, it digs further and further into his past. It digs further and further into figuring out what Black Bolt is about. And this is when we start to realize that what it's looking for is the Infinity Gauntlet. But where it does find the Infinity Stones, which were controlled and really possessed by the Illuminati for quite some time, this is a group that basically had like a, a hidden hand inside the, the event that took place in Marvel Comics, what it also learns is the Infinity Stones have been destroyed. Now again, this dealt with the collapse of the multiverse. This dealt with the idea that when you had worlds crashing into each other, basically another universe crashing into the main Marvel Universe, the Illuminati's response was, gather the Infinity Gauntlet, you gather the Infinity Stones. We can literally use the power of our universe to push that universe away. But the Infinity Stones shattered, the Time Stone disappeared, and the Gauntlet is basically defunct now. It doesn't work anymore. And that's what the Outrider realizes. There are no more Infinity Stones left. They're all gone. But then suddenly, Black Bolt wakes up, says, get out of my mind, and then goes to attack the Outrider. Now, where the Outrider tries to make its way out of a Tillin, cuts through a few people here and there, ultimately Black Bolt catches up to it, uses his quasi-sonic scream to try to disable it, but it ultimately ends up getting away. And so the question is, what is this thing? Why is it here? And why is it looking for the Infinity Stones? And so at this point, we jump back to the peak. We jump back to Captain America and all these guys. And this is cool because remember, when it comes to the Earth superheroes, uh, for the most part, they usually are Earth-based. But what you also have is a character named Smasher. Now, Smasher is an Earthling, but she's the first Earthling to be inducted into the Shi'ar Imperial Guard. Now, we've talked about this before. The Shi'ar Empire is just a, an amalgamation of different races, which have all sworn fealty to, like, the existing leader of the Shi'ar Empire. But with the Shi'ar Empire, you have what's called the Imperial Guard. And the Imperial Guard is basically some of the hardest, most intense, and most capable warriors that exist all across the face of the universe. And they're, they're drawn from, like, all different facets of the Shi'ar Empire, and even some are drawn from beyond the Shi'ar Empire. But they're basically exceedingly 
exceedingly capable. And with Smasher being a part of the uh, the Shi'ar Imperial Guard, that basically what she says is, your concerns are legitimate. Where well, you're picking up all this radio chatter, and it's essentially every single major empire that exists out there in space that's recalling all of its soldiers from every foreign battle, where they're calling in every single ounce of armed force they have. The reason for this is because something is mobilizing in the universe that has the ability to obliterate entire worlds. The indication here is that they're worried about the builders. The builders are going from planet to planet, blowing them up, destroying them in their entirety. And where the Avengers try to get a hand on things, what we end up finding out is that if the builders show up on Earth and there's no one there to stop them, they will annihilate the entirety of the planet and every single superhero on Earth will die. And so this is a mobilization. It's an attempt by Captain America and Iron Man and Captain Marvel Carol Danvers to basically rally all the Avengers together and then send them out in space for the purpose of trying to take out these builders before they arrive on Earth. The problem with this is we pick back up with Titan. And when we pick up with Titan, we end up having this outrider who shows back up again and basically gives all this information to Corvus Glaive, who's also met with Proxima Midnight, Black Dwarf, the Ebony Maw, and Supergiant, basically the Black Order. And when this happens, what we end up finding out is that the Infinity Gauntlet's gone. The, the, the Gauntlet itself is on Earth, but the stones have been destroyed, everything except for the Time Stone, and that this planet can be offered as a tribute. The biggest caveat to this, and the biggest reason why this is so important, is that once we end up having Corvus Glaive make the declaration and ask the question to Thanos, where do you want us to go? Thanos says, we want to go to Earth. The various people here respond because Earth has a reputation. A lot of places hate Earth. They despise Earth, but they also recognize some of the most powerful beings in the universe originate from Earth. And so this is one of those things where people look around and they say, the planet Earth is the place where villains go to die. Like no one ever goes there and comes out on top. The heroes always win. If we go there with nefarious schemes, they will destroy us and they will kill us and we'll just be another notch in the belt. But the cool thing about this is that Corvus Glaive says, under normal circumstances, yes. But I've learned that there's discord in the Inhuman Royal Family, that the X-Men are, are experiencing a schism. Remember, we covered the schism event where Wolverine and Cyclops basically experienced a rift and they split apart and launched their own X-Men schools. The Earth is in shambles in a variety of ways. All this comes out of civil war. But the most important thing to take away from all this is that the Avengers have left Earth. There are no Avengers on the planet Earth. It is ripe for the picking. Now from here, we jump to the, really like this, this massive battle that took place between like the Avengers and the various empires of the universe that were facing off against the builders. And this is kind of crazy because in this particular battle that happened, like it was a massacre. And it's interesting because when the superheroes showed up, when the various Avengers and so on showed up, they found like what appeared to be a paltry fleet that belonged to the, to the builders. And maybe it was one of those things of like the builders had a weapon that was just so powerful, but if they destroy the ship, they destroy the weapon and all the superheroes win. And so for the most part, they kind of went into it with with perceptions of guaranteed victory but like the best laid plans of mice and men what ended up happening is a ruse was revealed that what the builders had done is they had basically cloaked a majority of their fleet and so once the superheroes got in there and once they were funneled into the hot gates and they were boxed in the fleet was decloaked and they were massacred and the avengers just like almost anybody else who survived was just fleeing for their life. It was the only thing that they could do. Now, the other half of this is that with Thanos being given word by like Corvus Glaive and so on, that basically the Infinity Stones have been lost. And when the Cole Obsidian said the only Infinity Stone that's left is a Time Stone which vanished, Thanos simply said, your job is to find it. I will worry about the Inhumans. I will deal with them. And so again, this is cool because what ends up happening is Corvus Glaive is initially sent to the Inhumans. But before we deal with, before we jump into that, what we end up finding out is that like the Black Order, when they showed up on Earth, they wrecked everyone. The X-Men, done. Like, those guys are, are finished. Atlantis was conquered by Proxima Midnight. Cor uh, I'm sorry, the Ebony Maw. This is one of the coolest things. The Ebony Maw is a really, really powerful sorcerer. The issue with this is that the Ebony Maw really, you know, really relies more on, like, duplicitous, and, you know, duplicity and manipulation. And what he had done is he had actually driven Doctor Strange to summon Shumagorath. There were all these things that went on. But in Wakanda, there was a fighting chance. Because where one of the Cole Obsidian showed up in Wakanda, they were wrecked. They were absolutely devastated by Black Panther and the Wakandans. Which which was so cool to see. I was like, man, this, this is an absolute beast. There are comics that deal with this, these various skirmishes and so on. But essentially what went on here is that by and large, with the exception of like a handful of places here and there, everybody had been taken out. Like everybody had been defeated and there really was no hope left for anybody else. Earth had essentially fallen. And so what ends up happening is we pick up with Corvus Glaive who shows up at the Inhuman Royal City. Now again, this little tidbit takes place before Thanos, you know, heads out and goes to deal with the Inhumans themselves. But Corvus Glaive shows up and immediately starts talking trash. 
He's like, hey guys, so I was told there was a king here, but I can't seem to find that king. Maybe it's because he's the king of a small, tiny little kingdom, an itty bitty kingdom that's irrelevant. Maybe that's why I can't find this king. Just like talking some serious smack. But it's interesting because remember, when it comes to Medusa and Black Bolt, Black Bolt can't really talk. He's got the quasi-sonic scream. So if he were to, to like utter a word, it has the potential to destroy an entire planet. So as a, as a result of this, Medusa basically speaks on his behalf. Now Medusa is not a pushover. She She's not someone to be trifled with. And she simply steps up and says, hey, look, you know, you can come here and talk all the trash all you want to. Just be aware, many have tried and many have failed. So you can come here to Attilan and you can make your threats, but you may not walk out of that. You may not walk out of this alive. But here's the caveat to this. The Cole Obsidian loves death. They worship death in the same way that Thanos does. And so for them, being killed is a welcoming thing. If you really believe that death is something that we fear, if you're so foolish as to believe that, then let me help you understand your place in the bigger picture. And in turn, like he has a soldiers cut their own throats just to show that they have no qualms with dying which means that any and all control any any type of you know manipulation the inhumans would have had at their hands threatening them with death and so on that it's all in vain there's nothing they can do and so when when the question is asked well then what do you want here then corvus glaive simply says a pittance a tribute the same thing he said before but this is when we start to find out what it is the question is well what is the pittance in the tribute that you want well then corvus glaive responds by saying we want the heads of every child that exists inside your inhuman city between the ages of 16 and 22. Now notice this. This is specific. It's not just all the heads of your kids. It's the heads of the kids between a certain age, which means that they're looking for something. But this is kind of cool because what ends up happening is that like, like Corvus Glaive says, look, you have an alternative here. Like you, you have a choice. You can die a little or you can die a lot. You can sacrifice the kids or we'll just come back and kill everyone. We've already taken down virtually every single city that exists. All your superhero teams are in pieces. The Avengers are in space. There's no one left to challenge us. So you can be the last man standing and you can be the last man to die. Make whatever choice you want to make. You have 24 hours and we're going to come back. And when we do, there has to be an answer. And so what we end up doing here is picking back up with really like the escaping members of the Galactic Council that are just fleeing for their lives, trying to get out of this, this conflict with the, the builders as fast as they can. And where they've all managed to make their escape, where they've all managed to get away, the remarshalling of forces begins to come back into play again. Because with the builders continuing to be out there, they have to be taken down. And the various superhero groups, the various interplanetary governments and interplanetary soldiers and teams and so on and so forth are all functioning as part of a unified front to try to take these guys down. They find small successes here and there and taking out like different factions of the builders armies but at the end of the day it doesn't matter because what ends up happening is the gardener ex nihilo just kind of takes off down to the planet and just kind of sacrifices his life but the result is that in doing so with the destruction of one of these beings what ends up happening is like the entire planet is basically sent into a state of decay and disease meaning those individuals who are left behind those who are stuck here on this planet men women and children alike they all just succumb to illness and disease and death. They literally just exist in this terrible circumstance of destruction. And so what ends up happening is you end up having Black Bolt who basically summons the rest of the Illuminati. Black Panther, Doctor Strange, Reed Richards, uh, Name of the Submariner, Iron Man, and Beast brings them all together and essentially says like, here's what's going on. Thanos is on Earth right now. Like while you guys are out there fighting this battle in space, Thanos is on Earth and Thanos is invading Earth. But Thanos is looking for something particular. He's looking for one thing. And when the question is asked, what is that? Black Bolt's like, look, I'll deal with him on my own. I'll deal with Thanos. Like, I'll give him my answer in my city by myself. But like what he's looking for is his son. That's why he's here. Thanos is looking for his son so he can kill him. All right. So uh, truth to tell, Infinity is turning out to be a lot more popular than I thought it would be. Man, I didn't realize you guys would be that excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really plan on doing any of the tie-ins. I just planned on doing like the main events and like the main story itself and then just kind of talking about the tie-ins as we go through it. But like I'm looking at the comments and, and looking at how many of you guys are watching it and I'm just like, okay, so I guess we will cover the tie-in where the Black Order like crushes the Earth superheroes. <laughs> now this is, this is cool. Like it's it's one of the coolest things ever. Like I, dude, I, I love the Call Obsidian. Like it's it's one of the coolest ideas, like having Thanos' own order. Now, one thing I want you guys to bear in mind, this. This, uh, the next video that, that comes out, we actually won't reference this because I'm recording this after I recorded that one, but we'll make sure this fits in terms of like the video playlist and, and you know, being in chronological order, all that kind of good stuff. But initially this picks up with what the Cole Obsidian has learned that the Infinity Stones are basically gone. Now remember, this comes from the Outrider. This comes from that Outrider that showed up on Earth and it was looking for the Infinity, uh, Infinity Stones so the Infinity Gauntlet could be reformed. And of course, once it reported back, its mind was red and we end up learning what it is that's going on. And it's kind of interesting because the Cole Obsidian does doesn't necessarily a 
agree with Thanos. In Thanos' mind, he is looking to regain absolute power. And even like, like Supergiant, it's just kind of like, okay, but there's only one stone left. There's only the time stone. And remember, we covered that in Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers. When the incursions were happening, Captain America got the Infinity Gauntlet. He tried to push one of the other universes away and it destroyed the Infinity Stones. Everything except for the time stone was shattered and the time stone disappeared. But because of the fact that it's still there, Thanos' response is, you only ever really need one stone and that makes you God. Not only that, like what this would do if Thanos got the time stone, he could just jump back into the past to the point when the Illuminati presumably had the Infinity Gems, he could just kill them all, take the Infinity Gems, jump back to the modern day, have a fully fleshed out Infinity Gauntlet and retain Godhood. But remember, it's kind of cool because for Thanos, being God is like a, it's like a drug because over the course of his publication history, he's been God a multitude of times. The first time it was the Cosmic Cube. The second time it was the Infinity Gauntlet. You know, we, we saw a handful of things going on. If you read uh, Marvel The End, he's had like the heart of the universe, the power of the one above all, and he destroyed the entire multiverse with that with that, that kind of power. Thanos has attained godhood in a multitude of ways, and even in his base form, without the Infinity Stones, he's crazy powerful. I mean, he went toe-to-toe -to -toe against Galactus, albeit Galactus was in a relatively weakened state, but he managed to like hold his own against Galactus, a cosmic entity. So, I mean, there's a lot of power to be had here, and it's kind of interesting because like, like the Ebony Maw kind of speaks up and is like, look, I mean, sure, we could go for this, but like there's other things that we could focus our efforts on. But again, this is an invasion fleet. Attack the Earth. Capture these, you know, capture the Infinity Stones. Those are Thanos' direct orders. And so what happens is this conflict takes place in a variety of different uh, different areas. Initially, the, the opening skirmish really takes place in New York. So you have like Reed Richards, you have uh, Iron Man, Tony Stark, and they're using whatever technology they have at their disposal. But you're talking about super advanced technology. The other part really comes with like Wakanda. And this is cool because Black Dwarf shows up on the doorstep of Black Panther. Now, let me tell you something, man. Wakanda is where villains go to die. Only a fool goes to Wakanda starting problems, right? Everyone loses. Like, no one wins. The only person who really successfully won was, like, Doctor Doom. And, like, he he started an insurrection. And that's one of the things I want you guys to be aware of. We already covered the story from Hickman's Fantastic Four where Black Panther stopped being the quote-unquote king of Wakanda and became the king of the dead. Now, a little bit of a, of a refresh here for those of you guys who didn't see that. Black Panther was king of Wakanda for years and years and years and years, at least T'Challa was. But there came a point when Black Panther was injured and then like acquiesced or really kind of ceded the throne to his sister Shuri who took over the role of Black Panther. The issue with this is that where T'Challa would have gone back to that role, Doctor Doom actually instigated an insurrection inside of Wakanda allowing a handful of, of really these insurgents to take over and basically oust everyone including Shuri and T'Challa himself. Now this whole scheme by Doctor Doom was for the purpose of acquiring all the vibranium stores of Wakanda which he did and the result was that in order for Doctor Doom to be defeated because vibranium amplifies magical energy, Black Panther had to render all vibranium across the world completely inert. But because of the fact that it was believed that he had totally shattered the economic standing of Wakanda, basically obliterated any and all financial resources that they had, ultimately, Shuri maintained the role of Black Panther and T'Challa became King of the Dead. But like Supergiant shows up on the doorstep of Black Panther and unbeknownst to him, gets absolutely wrecked because Black Panther is a beast. That's why I do, I love the way Hickman writes Black Panther because he's like, hey man, you know, look, you can come here and you can pick a fight. Just, just be aware. Many have tried and many have failed. But from here, we switch over to Atlantis. This is another thing that I want to I want to kind of focus on here and I want to talk about for a second. The the animosity between Namor the Submariner and Black Panther is only ever has only ever really been a recent thing. I mean, for the most part, they they were kind of teammates, and I mean, you know, they worked together from time to time. But the reason why there was so much animosity at the time this story was being written was because of a story called Avengers vs. X-Men, which we've covered. And Avengers vs. X-Men saw Namor the Submariner basically getting one part of the Phoenix Force, which was also split among Emma Frost of the X-Men, Cyclops of the X-Men. Uh, Colossus and uh, and his sister Magic. The result is that Name of the Submariner launched an attack against Wakanda and destroyed the entirety of the Necropolis and the whole nine yards. So Wakanda is still in a rebuilding phase. But in response to this, Black Panther destroyed the entirety of Atlantis. Like he sent his soldiers, sent his forces to Atlantis, invaded it, and just razed it to the ground. And so at this point, Atlantis is on the verge of complete and total destruction. So when Proxima Midnight shows up on the doorstep of Name of the Submariner and says, "We're looking for the Infinity Stones. Tell me where they are, or I'll destroy what Paul." little kingdom you have left. And so for Name of the Submariner to be told, Atlantis will be destroyed. Whatever little soldiers you have left, they'll be totally annihilated. I'll destroy you and everything that you know and love. Then it's like, okay, I'll do whatever I have to do in order to make sure Atlantis is safe. But vengeance is on his mind. And so when the question is asked by Proxima Midnight, where is the Infinity Stones? Where should I send all these forces of Thanos? The response of Name of the Submariner is, it's in Wakanda. Because that way it'll see just the total destruction of Black Panther and everything in Wakanda itself. But from here, we move to what's 
probably one of the best parts of Infinity. We move to the Ebony Maw. Now, I love the Ebony Maw. Oh my God, I love Ebony Maw. He is such a great character. The whole idea is that he uses words to basically dupe people into doing things, but he's basically ensnared Doctor Strange. And that's what's so cool about this is because you're talking about like the master of the mystic arts, right? Like Doctor Strange has for the most part over the course of his life seen and done it all. I mean, you have all kinds of characters out there that Doctor Strange has, has had to contend against that are insanely powerful. Then you have someone like the Ebony Maw and he just shows up and just whispers things into the ear of Doctor Strange and then suddenly he's ensnared. And so it's, it's interesting and it's wild because at this moment right now, he's basically just a pawn. But at this point, we switch over to the Jean Grey school. Now, something else that I, I want you guys to also be aware of, the Jean Grey school and really the X-Men at the time this story is written, they're basically in shambles, right? Like this comes out of Schism and we cover the Schism story. That was basically a story where Wolverine and Cyclops had two distinctly different views on what direction the, you know, Xavier school for gifted youngsters should go in. And because they had basically irreconcilable differences, they basically had their own little mini civil war. And you had Wolverine who broke off and formed the Jean, uh, Jean Grey school of higher learning. And then you had Cyclops who stayed at the Xavier school and they just ran two different institutions. But that's why you don't see like the full brunt of the X-Men here. It's basically just Wolverine's X-Men team and Cyclops's team isn't here. But showing up alongside Supergiant and Corvus Glaive, this is cool because Corvus Glaive is like the first of the five, right? Like he's like the first of the, of the Cole Obsidian. But like Supergiant is nothing to scoff at. And in fact, Supergiant actually goes through, analyzes all the powers of the mutants who were here and says, okay, so you have two types. You have alpha mutants and you have omega level mutants. The alpha mutants, don't worry about them. The omega level ones are the ones we have to worry about. And that's true. Like we know that from covering like the omega level mutant series. You're talking about mutants that have no definitive end to the power they possess. It's basically infinite. And the first person she sees this control of is Iceman. Because Iceman is probably the character who's, who's easiest to use to basically freeze everybody up to completely and totally take them over. But then suddenly you have Wolverine who jumps in. But the issue with this is that as soon as he jumps into the fray, he's immediately impaled by Corvus Glaive. And he's like, done. Like, you're you're done. You're finished, man. Like, I don't know what to tell you, man. But like, you're done. There's there's nothing else with you besides this whole thing. Like, like that's it. And so the result is that switching back over to Wakanda, what we end up finding out is like Super Giant, I'm sorry, not Super Giant, the Black Dwarf just got wrecked. Like he was just, he was absolutely decimated. But it's kind of funny because where Shuri and the other members of Wakanda would relish in this and celebrate, Black Panther, like T'Challa, he's hardened. Like he's been down this road a multitude of times, especially when it came to like Ulysses Claw. And so the idea in his mind is they weren't, I mean, sure, they weren't really looking for this kind of resistance. They weren't really expecting to show up here and get absolutely like, like steamrolled by Wakanda. But once they're here, they're looking for a thing in particular. And so they will come back with a much larger force. And that's what he's concerned about. And so what ends up happening is that we pick up in the aftermath of this, right? Like we pick up with Thanos' ship sitting over Attilan, but it's kind of cool because you have like the Black Dwarf, you've got Corvus Glaive, you got Proxima Midnight, you know, you have everybody except for the Ebony Maw who basically show up here. Now remember, when it comes to Thanos and the Black Order, for the most part, they're given a lot of leeway, right? Like Thanos is like, here's my instructions, complete them, I don't care how you do it, as long as you do not come back here with failure. That's basically the rule. And so they're kind of given free reign. And the Ebony Maw is no different. When Thanos looks at the Ebony Maw, he basically says, okay, look, his, his methods aren't necessarily normal. They're pretty unorthodox orthodox, but he gets results. And at the end of the day, that's all I care about because people are asking like, where's the Ebony Maw? We can't communicate with him telepathically. He's not using his communicator. He's basically gone off the reservation. He's, he's off the radar entirely. But Thanos isn't really worried about that because the Ebony Maw always gets results. The issue with this is that the other members are really, uh, the, you know, Proxima Midnight says, look, according to Namor the Submariner, he told me that like the time stones in Wakanda. So we're going to have to go to Wakanda. Now, Thanos' response is cool, but I'm going to go down to the, to the Inhuman Royal City first. I'm going to deal with them and we'll find out out, you know, where that extends to in the, in the next video. But in this one, it's kind of cool because, you know, like the black dwarf is like, Hey man, look, I'm, I'm really, really sorry. I failed. You know, I'm sorry. I screwed up, but I'll make up for it, man. And Thanos is like, no, no, you will not like you, like one, I'm going to smash your head into the ground. I'm going to help you understand your place in the bigger picture. And then you're going to go sit in a cell and you're just going to wait until I call for you. Now, this is a pretty significant thing because for the Cole Obsidian, one of the most important things they can do is one, please Thanos. And two, if they please Thanos to hand their lives over to death, that's really what they should shoot for. But with Thanos being displeased, it's like the ultimate failure on their behalf. They lose respect of the other members, you know, from the other members of the Cole Obsidian. And so the result is that Black Dwarf is just kind of in a, in a pretty rough spot at the moment. And so what ends up happening here is like the entire force of Wakanda, Black Panther, Shuri, all their soldiers, the whole nine yards are basically forced to look on as Thanos' invasion fleet moves full on into Wakanda. Proxima Midnight, Corvus Glaive, you know, Supergiant, the whole nine yards. They all basically make their move onto Wakanda. And the question that's left here is, what chance does Wakanda have? What possible hope do they have against the entire brunt of Thanos' 
armies combined with the Black Order along with Thanos presumably showing up after he's done dealing with the Inhumans. Man, I was looking through the comments for the first Infinity video we did and like people were screaming at me to finish the rest of it. <laughs> People were just like, you gotta finish Infinity! Man, it is it is an amazing story. It is so good. Like, I understand where you guys are coming from. But yeah, okay, so in the first video, like, we, we talked about how we had two stories going on at the same time. You have the Avengers in space, because you have the Builders, who were just like this really ancient race, who were responsible for basically the creation of everything, and were just like running across the cosmos, just like obliterating all these planets and stuff. And so the Avengers, like, basically went to go check it out at the request of, like, the members of the Galactic Council and so on. And so basically, you had, like, this army composed of all these empires across the universe which it all banded together for the purpose of trying to take on these builders and they all got deuced on like they all got wrecked <laughs> they just weren't prepared and then like you had Thanos who invaded earth with the black order and like they show up and they crush everybody like almost everybody Wakanda is like the only country that really succeeds in fending anybody off because you know Black Panther's a beast so so like picking up with this this whole battle that goes on with the with the Avengers and the builders the Galactic Council and everything like it's really just retreat right like the first skirmish they engaged in they were just crushed by the builders. And so what they ended up doing was taking refuge on like a, a massive citadel of sorts. But the builders started sending out all these sentient drones that were just like destroying this facility. And it was a message, right? It was a message going out to the universe. You can run, you can hide, but it won't last long. We will find you no matter where you go. And so what this did is it put all these different races in a position where they had to, they had to make a choice. Either they could bend, they could acquiesce, and they could give up to the builders, or they could fight to the death and die. And like almost all these empires, you know, every single one of these races that had, that had spanned for thousands and thousands and millions of years it was basically just giving up the centaurians were the first ones to fall the chameleons fell next and then the kree now these are all races that have appeared over the course of various eras in in marvel comics now this also still brings together the galactic council of course you have ron and the accuser who speaks on behalf of the kree empire and then you have people like like gladiator of the shiar and then you've got jason of spartax the father of peter quill you've got all these people who are just kind of banded together and for the most part the avengers were never allowed into the galactic council because everybody hates earth but this whole thing deals with the idea of like Captain America stepping in alongside Thor as an advisor of sorts and really just like a handful of the Avengers and everybody speaking as part of this galactic council. But these are all the various empires that exist all throughout space. So you've got the Brood, you've got the Scrolls, you've got the Kree, Annihilus, you have all these different races that exist there and they're all basically, you know, more or less saying the same thing. Everyone except Captain America. The answer that's being given by virtually everybody is no victory can be found here. The only real option we have is to basically give up. But Captain America's response is, but why though? Like, like, we can win. All we have to do is find a way to win. Now, this is kind of ironic because Captain America is talking to people who are part of a, part of races and empires. They were mature races when humanity was fledgling, when humanity was just now emerging onto the scene. And so what Captain America says is that at this point, we have to find a way to bolster our forces. And when we face off against the builders, some of our number were captured. If we can rescue them and rescue those who were not necessarily part of our teams, but have been captured anyway, we can increase our number in that capacity. And it's a smart move liberate innocent people, liberate refugees, liberate the superheroes, and all of them will rally to our side. And that's what happens. Captain America, you know, and Thor says, we need bait. We need somebody to go in there and we need someone to dupe the, the builders into focusing on us so they don't look at what's going on over here. And that's exactly what happens. Captain America and the, the Galactic Council send their ships in and they just operate as bait. They go in, they fight against the builders and the builders see this as, why are they here again? Like, are they really wanting to fight again? And that's how it's designed to come across. Be a distraction, take their attention away from what you're really trying to achieve. And what we end up finding out is the builders made a mistake. The builders made a huge mistake. They made a very, very costly mistake because once we get in there, once some of the forces of Captain America's armies get in there, then they start liberating different Avengers. One of the Avengers they liberate is the Incredible Hulk. And let me, man, let me tell you something, man. Man, let me tell you something. The Incredible Hulk breaks out and just starts crushing everything, like literally destroys the ship on his own, just starts ripping through every single device he can find. From there, like they immediately teleport him out. But the cool thing is that they still have to destroy these other two weapon ships that are controlled by the builders. So they in turn send in Thor along with a handful of other people. And of course they're able to pull it off by just destroying things. But what this does is it brings in Starbrand. Now Starbrand we talked about before, right? Like it's this idea that you have what's called the white event. And the white event was basically an initiation that took place that whenever there was like a massive universal threat, really once every generation, a new person would be chosen to be the Starbrand. But it was one of these things where they would have however much power they needed for a particular point in time. It's really kind of a caveat. It's one of those things where it's just sort of, sort of like, here's a character that lets me do whatever I want to do at any particular point in time, but they're not omnipotent and indestructible. They can be destroyed. But Starbrand serves this purpose. He basically destroys a huge portion of the Builder army, which in turn 
like allows some measure of the tide to turn. But again, this is not the full brunt of the Builder Army. This is just a portion of it. Picking up with Attilan, Thanos shows back up to the Inhuman City because remember, Black Bolt, the king of the Inhumans, was told, you've got 24 hours. When, when Corvus Glaive showed up at the home of the Inhumans, he said, you've got 24 hours. Either you pay the gauntlet or you pay the tribute. The gauntlet is Thanos comes here and raises this city to the ground. The tribute is you kill all of your kids between 16 and 22 and bring us their heads as proof. Black Bolt says, no. He says, no, I'm, I'm not killing any of our kids. Not only that, he basically evacuates the entire, like has the, the whole city of Attilan evacuated so that when they show up there, when Thanos shows up there, there's nothing left. The only exception is Lockjaw and Maximus the Mad, the brother of Black Bolt. Now, Maximus the Mad being here serves a couple purposes. The first is that all of the Inhumans are going through the teleportation device known as Eldrak, who was an Inhuman at one point. Or I guess he was, a, yeah, I guess he was. And once he went through the mist, he basically became a door that's almost like the Siege Perilous, that when you go through it, it takes you wherever you need to be at that particular point in time. But Maximus the Mad and, and Lockjaw, the teleporting dog, are really the only ones left. And Maximus basically activates a massive bomb underneath Attilan itself. So when Thanos shows up, Thanos arrives and says, look, man, you had 24 hours and your 24 hours is up. Now, I'm Thanos, man. So, like, it's nothing for me to destroy this place. If I obliterate the entirety of Attilan, for you, it's the end of times. For me, it's a Tuesday. So we can do whatever you want to do. Like, it doesn't matter to me, man. Tell me what you want, what you want to do. Do you want to die or do you just want to sacrifice your kids? And Black Bolt just screams at Thanos. Now, old school Black Bolt would have probably obliterated the Earth had he screamed like this as loud as he possibly could. But Black Bolt's power has been toned down over the years to make his character one that can be defeated for the most part. I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. For example, like if you read House of M, he whispers at the villain Apocalypse, destroys Apocalypse and wipes out what amounts to about a hundred acres of land, probably a little bit more. Whereas if you have this, like he screams and not nearly as much destruction happens. So it really kind of depends on what era you're talking about. Now, House of M Black Bolt was stupidly overpowered. Like it was, he was criminally OP. It was insane. But Black Bolt screaming serves a couple of purposes. The first is to try to destroy Thanos. And the second is to activate the Terrigen Bomb, to basically detonate this Terrigen Bomb on Earth. Now, from here, we transition to a city called Orolan, which is basically hidden on Earth. Now, this is very, very important because really up until this point, there wasn't really any such thing as like secondary inhuman cities, right? Like in Marvel Comics, you had Attilan and that was it. What Attilan did and how it functioned was contextual. For example, Attilan was basically a hidden city on Earth where the Inhumans lived. And it was that way forever and ever and ever. And then Paul Jenkins and Jay Lee in 1998 wrote Inhumans Volume 2. They basically told this 12 issue story where Black Bolt tricked his own people. He literally orchestrated orchestrated an assault on Attilan so that his people would, would finally agree with him when he says, we need to leave Earth. And so Attilan took up residence on the blue area of the moon. That led into the events of War of Kings when eventually the, uh, the Attilans took over the entirety of the Kree Empire. Eventually they came back. They ended up, you know, returning back to Earth again. And then they just sort of reside above the city of New York and they've been there ever since. But there have never really been other inhuman cities. This is really the first time that we start to see Marvel expand this. Now, Jonathan Hickman really did this for the sake of this story. And the reason why is because where you ended up having like the main city of Attilan where the Inhuman Royal Family has always resided, there were members of the Royal Family who defected or even, you know, even just like other members of the Inhuman Society that basically broke off. But in the city of Aroland, what you have is a shard of the Terrigen Crystals. And what it does is it allows this city to basically implement Terrigenesis among its own people, but only once every generation. And so the result is that they hope that people will gain like the best minds or different abilities or what have you. But we pick up with a guy named Thane. And Thane is basically just a healer. That's really kind of like the quote-unquote gift that he has. But the indication here is that he's never actually been exposed to Terrigenesis. He's really more of just like a medic, but he's not one of those people who's been chosen for Terrigenesis. What ends up happening is that when this bomb goes off, the Terrigen mist spread throughout the world. Now, for those of you guys who are wondering in Marvel Comics right now, and especially the events of like Inhumans versus X-Men, why the Inhumans had risen to prominence the way they did, this is the reason why. This is the story that saw the detonation of the Terrigen bomb and the Terrigen mist spreading throughout the rest of the, uh, rest of the world. And what Marvel did it was actually pretty cool because what you had was a line of stories that came immediately after this written by Charles Soule. So you had Inhumanity, you had Inhuman that basically explored like the aftermath of these, these Terrigen myths spreading throughout the world and all these, you know, basically hidden Inhumans that didn't know they were Inhuman suddenly going through the process of Terrigenesis out in the middle of nowhere in subway stations, walking along the street and office buildings and, and capital buildings all throughout the world. Leaders even became Inhumans not realizing they were Inhuman the entire time. The problem is that Marvel squandered that and instead going into all 
do all different Marvel. They push the X-Men into the background. They try to promote the Inhumans, which everybody knows doesn't work because nobody really cares about the Inhumans. And so because of this, like with this bomb going off, Thanos is like, okay, man. So like, that's your answer. Your answer is that you want to fight, then we can fight. Just be aware, man. Like when you fight me, I fight to the death. I'm probably going to kill you because like you've irritated me and that's just what's going to happen. So we, so like immediately he starts screaming, right? He's like, where's my son? Tell me where my son is because he knows the Inhumans know the location of his son, but he won't like Black Bolt won't give it up. Now, of course, at this point, pretense is out the window. Thanos had basically lied to the Black Order saying, well, it's just, it's a tribute is what it is. These are the things I demand. Just do what I tell you to and don't ask questions. Now, Black Bolt figured out earlier on that the whole subtext was that Thanos was hunting for his son. And because Black Bolt knows that and Thanos knows Black Bolt knows that, then we're just throwing all pretense out the window. And it's just like, okay, you know that I'm here looking for my son. Tell me where my son is. And if you don't tell me, I'm going to destroy you and I'm going to destroy everything you care about. Now, what this does is it leads in to one of the most beastly moments in the history of comics dude it's, it's one of it's like one of the greatest thanos moments of all time black bolt goes to scream and thanos is just like you know what dude enough man if this is how it's gonna be he's like fine then man like keep your secrets carry them with you to the grave like smashes his head in the ground i'm just like dude thanos how beast are you like knocks out black bolt in one hit and he's like fine if this is how it's gonna be then like i will find my son myself and i'll kill him myself that boy's gonna die and with thane having undergone terogenesis then his inhuman genes are activated and suddenly his powers begin to emerge although he doesn't really have control over it now at this point man this man this is when the story gets man this is when the story gets so good thor fans if you are a fan of Thor, now is your time to shine. Because what happens is Thor shows up, right? Like, like you have the, the builders who are on Kree and like Captain America is like, okay, so like basically we have to surrender. Like we have to give up. So they send a guy to, to Kree, right? You know, to, to the Kree world of Hala. And like the, you know, running the accusers is, is like, there is, you know, Captain America and his forces, they're sending an emissary here to basically surrender, to give up to you guys. And so Thor shows up and Thor's talking to this builder. They're told, look, you can't be armed. So Thor's like, whatever, throws his hammer into the sky, says, okay, fine, I'm unarmed. So the builder's talking to him. Thor Thor's like, look, I came here to discuss terms of surrender. And the builder's like, no, there are no terms. There's you give up and you take a knee or like I kill you and then we destroy the rest of your allies. So like, what's, what's it going to be? And so like, it's it's crazy, right? Because like, while this is happening, like everybody's praying, like all the accusers are there and like the Galactic Council's watching this, like all eyes are on Thor. So the builder's like, take a knee. And so Thor just kneels. Thor, Thor kneels down. He's like, okay, fine. I surrender. We take a knee. And so like, it's funny because the builder starts talking trash, right? He's like, humanity's place is to take a knee. Like your place is below us we're builders people don't want you here like no one wants you here so we are going to do the universe a favor and we're going to eradicate you suddenly they hit like there's there's this thing like you know you're, you're with like captain america and those guys and they're like they're like hey gladiator like we have incoming and he's like what is it and captain america's like it's a reckoning is what it is thor's hammer comes flying back down bam and it goes punching right through this builder punches a hole right through him and captain america's like got him if they can be broken they can be killed that's it they're like we can destroy these guys we can kill builders they're not indestructible they're highly durable but they're not indestructible and so Thor's like, all right, he's, so he's like, Ron and the accuser, got a question for you. And Ron is like, what's up? He's like, do you have free men and women here? And Ron is like, yes. And he's like, do these free, uh, free men and women, will they fight for what they believe in? Ronan says, yes. Thor rallies the entire Kree army to their side, an army of thousands and thousands of people, rallies them all and says, it's time for battle. And Captain America's response, when, when the question is asked by a gladiator, like what comes next? Captain America's response is, now we win. Now we finally take back the universe. Okay, so uh, we are concluding Infinity. We're we're finally wrapping the story up, and and God, I love Infinity so much. You know what? I might do what we've done with like Blackest Night and Brightest Day and all that kind of stuff, and just like combine this into one big video. I think it's a cool idea because I know there are some of you guys who were just kind of like, I want to see like the whole thing in its entirety. So I do kind of like. I think we might start doing that from now on. Like whenever we do like videos where where things are like split into sections and then combine it into one big video, like once we're done. But uh, the cool thing about this is we basically pick up with the Avengers coming. From from space and showing back up on Earth. With all these groups showing up here, having allied themselves and coordinated themselves with Captain America arriving on Earth, for the most part, there's two battles that take place. One of them is out in space and the other one is basically trying to like punch a hole for Captain America and his guys to get through. And that's what happens. Captain America and his forces, uh, really like Thor and Hyperion, the Incredible Hulk, uh, Carol Danvers, you know, Captain Marvel, Captain America, they basically finally manage to make their way back to Earth. And when they do, it's okay, we have to organize this. Now, in truth, with the way that Jonathan Hickman wrote this, this, you could have like the guardians of the galaxy who arrive and like all the forces of Thanos are destroyed. But remember, when it comes to the planet Earth, it's an Avengers world. It's a place where like the Avengers keep the place taken care of because this is basically just the story of the Avengers versus Thanos. And that's what it boils down to. But it's kind of fighting for the protection of Earth, which is cool. Now, of course, with the Incredible Hulk being here, 
you gotta bring out your big guns, right? I mean, you're talking about Thanos. It's something that you kinda have to, you kinda have to do it. And it's cool because one thing to bear in mind is that in Marvel Comics, Thanos has kind of like a, not really a fear of, of the Incredible Hulk, but recognizes the dangers of the Hulk. We saw that in the Thanos versus Hulk story, where, where Thanos basically said, look, like I've always avoided fighting the Incredible Hulk because his strength is limitless. And so when it comes to the Hulk as a character, he's one of those guys where if you don't have the ability to like take him out immediately, like as soon as the Hulk emerges, he'll just keep getting angrier and angrier and eventually will just overpower you. That's just kind of how the character works. And so Captain America immediately sends him out and says, get out there, do your thing, be a distraction, tear up as much stuff as you possibly can. Now, the other half of this is we have the Illuminati, right? Like Black Panther and Doctor Strange and Reed Richards and Iron Man and so on, name of the Submariner. And they're all basically here at the Necropolis in Wakanda, the city of the dead, in order to try to find a way to stop the bomb from being, deact or being activated by Supergiant. The issue is that when they get there, the bomb's already set in motion. It's already been activated. It's just waiting for a trigger. But Supergiant has also seized control of Black Bolt. Now remember, we talked about this before, right? Like old school Black Bolt from like the 70s and 80s, his voice could shatter planets. His power has been reduced over time. Now, in terms of how Marvel justifies this in the modern day, what they basically say is like the detonation of the Terrigen Bomb helped to reduce the powers of Black Bolt. Exactly how, I don't think is really specified, but basically that's kind of the, uh, the explanation that's offered, the sort of scenario that's given here. But the long and short of it is that for the most part, like the armor of Tony Stark and Doctor Strange and the various, you know, capabilities they have, they can, for the most part, withstand the full might of Black Bolt's voice. Beast would be totally destroyed. But because of the fact that the armor of Tony Stark gives him really enhanced durability in a lot of different ways, Doctor Strange can use whatever spells he needs to, and then with the Submariner, is just highly durable because of the fact that he's basically a mutant and Atlantean and mutant hybrid. What this means is that Beast is really the only one who wouldn't who wouldn't stand much of a chance. And so, of course, you have Namor push Beast out of the way, and then it's really really cool here because Doctor Strange sort of chimes in, and Doctor Strange basically says, "Look, like you guys have pushed us to the brink time and time again, wanting to see what happens, wanting to see how far we fall. So if what you want to see is oblivion, if what you want to see is the abyss, then allow me to oblige. Allow me as the Sorcerer Supreme to bring to life your worst nightmares. And so what we end up doing is jumping directly to the Inhuman Royal City of Orolan. <laughs> we pick back up with Thanos. And this is cool because Thanos being here with what's left of the Black Order, meaning that like Black Dwarf has basically been defeated. He's pretty much out of the picture. And then you've got Supergiant with the Illuminati. All you really have left here is Proxima Midnight, Corvus Glaive, the Ebony Maw, and of course, Thane, the son of Thanos, who's held in stasis. But it's cool because Thanos starts to talk about how life is sort of meaningless and, and the, the usual rigmarole that he usually, you know, that he goes through. And then suddenly they're met with the arrival of the Incredible Hulk. Now, Thanos punches the Hulk out of the way, but keep in mind, and, and notice this, Thanos does not immediately jump into battle with the Incredible Hulk. And again, there's a reason for this. He sends Corvus Glaive and he sends Proxima Midnight to deal with the Hulk because for the most part, they can hold their own against, uh, against the Hulk himself. And this comes by way of the fact that by the various powers that they have, especially Proxima Midnight using her abilities to force him back into his Bruce Banner form. What this means is it leaves the field open for Thanos to deal with whatever comes next. And what comes next is Captain America, Hyperion, Thor, and Captain Marvel, Carol Danvers. Now, in Necropolis, switching back over to the Necropolis with Doctor Strange, what we end up finding out is that he actually starts to bring out Shuma Gorath. Not completely, but partially. The Shuma Gorath is an interesting concept, and we've never really talked about him before. We have in so far as like the mini angled ones, but like Shuma Gorath was actually yanked out of his native dimension by Doctor Strange and brought into the main Marvel Universe as part of Infinity. We didn't cover that section of the story because it's a small set of events that takes place with like Luke Cage's Mighty Avengers, but that's really about it. But it is cool because Shuma Gorath is far less powerful in the main Marvel Universe than he is in his native dimension. And it's even hypothesized, depending on what story you're talking about, that like Shuma Gorath can never actually be defeated. And like Galactus, Shuma Gorath appears to any given race based on how that race would perceive him. So it's, it's kind of an interesting thing, but still it is cool because ultimately you have like Reed Richards who sort of uses his powers to stretch and kind of intervenes and starts binding in and, and basically separates Black Bolt from, uh, from Supergiant who's just mentally controlling Black Bolt himself. And so from there, it's kind of cool because what we end up getting is like, like Black Panther sort of trying to speak to Supergiant and say, look, you're wasting your time here. Like this is preposterous. I don't know why you're trying to set this bomb off because you're going to destroy everything and everyone, but like your goals and your schemes won't really come to fruition. Like you're going to kill yourself here, you know? And that's what, that's again, the theme is constantly hit on when it comes to the Black Order. Something else that I want to hit on too, because somebody mentioned this in a comment in the last video. In the in the movie Infinity War, Black Dwarf is actually going to be called the Coal Obsidian. Like, like Marvel changed his name for the movie. The Coal Obsidian is the name of the Black Order. Thanos calls the Black Order the Coal Obsidian. The Black Order call themselves the Black Order because they think it sounds cooler. But still, like, like the Black Order, like they desire death. You know, every single member of the Black Order that Thanos appeared to, especially here with Supergiant, was at a moment in their life when they craved death, when they basically wanted to die. And Thanos is 
response was, I will give you what you wish. I will give you death, but you will have to fulfill a task for me first. That's how he works. Because remember, Thanos has an affection for Mistress Death. He loves the idea of death. He's a nihilist. And so the result is that when these various people were in this point, he just kind of used that as a way to just kind of Shanghai them into his own order. And then in turn, they carry out his schemes in the hopes that he will free them from life, so to speak. Now, again, it's cool because switching back over to a Rollin, this is when you really start to get like into the nitty gritty of the Ebony Maw. And this is why I love the Ebony Maw so much. Not just because of the fact that like the name is amazing, dude. I love the name, the Ebony Maw. Like, I love that name so much. It is so cool. But it's also because like, like, look at the things he says. See, this is why the Ebony Maw is so awesome. No real powers to speak of, but like, look at the things he says. I mean, basically talking to Thane, it's like, look at what you're watching here. You're watching the Earth's Avengers, the Earth's superheroes fighting off against the Coal Obsidian. And sure, they might defeat the Coal Obsidian. And in fact, for the most part, they do. But you have like some of the most powerful beings in the universe. Carol Danvers, Captain Marvel, Thor, the Incredible Hulk, Captain America. You have some of the greatest heroes in the history of the planet Earth and even some of the greatest heroes across the universe. And what they're doing is getting wrecked. Why? Because there's two kinds of people in the universe. Those who know that with Thanos comes death and those who are so foolish to believe that if they pray to the sky, to a God that's up there listening, that maybe that God will spare them from the wrath of a Titan of Thanos' caliber. Maybe they'll be safe, but they're foolish for believing so. With Thanos comes death. Death is always there to follow. Only a fool believes they stand a chance in, in, the, in the face of Thanos' might. And that's what's so cool about this because like it's what we would expect. Like what you're seeing here with Thanos just like deucing all over Earth superheroes, that's going to be Infinity War. For for the Earth superheroes, it's it's the end of times. For Thanos, it's a Tuesday. Like it's not a huge deal. It's just kind of like whatever, man. You know, this is what I do. I destroy things. So like either you can just be one of the many people I've killed or you can get out of my way. But that, that's what we would expect. Now again, something else that takes place is, is it's kind of cool. Dealing with like Super Giant, she's kind of whisked out of the picture pretty fast. You have her hunting for the trigger more or less and then Maximus the Mad appears the brother of, of, of Black Bolt. Now, Maximus the Mad is kind of interesting because he's an on-again, off-again villain. He's one of those characters where he does whatever he needs to do to satisfy his own end. So think of him as like an inhuman version of Loki in a lot of ways. And because of this, when he appears to, uh, to Supergiant, he has a trigger in his hand and says, look, if you do what I ask, then I'll give you this trigger. I'll give you whatever, you know, I'll, I'll give you what it is that you seek. And the response is, okay, like, like what are you, you know, what are you looking for? And what he says is the same, the same thing I always want, to basically be the smartest person in the room. That's the only thing I ever really want. And I'm proving that now because you forgot about the most dangerous thing in the room. And so what ends up happening is he basically triggers the bomb. And in the moment when the bomb is triggered, Lockjaw, the teleporting dog, teleports the bomb and Supergiant away and then teleports back and Supergiant gets blown to pieces. It's so cool and it's so smart. Like it's, it's pretty funny, but Supergiant of course is, is ultimately destroyed. But again, transitioning back to like to, to Thane with the Illuminati and all those forces showing, you know, intending to show back up to where Captain America is to help in the fight with Thanos with the Ebony Maw talking to Thane. Again, it's so cool. And this is what I love so much about this is it's basically like, look, only a fool would believe they have a chance to live against a being of, of Thanos' caliber who worships death. With Thanos comes death. It's an absolute rule of the universe. But when you end up having uh, Proxima Midnight, who of course throws her various weapons at uh, Captain America, with Captain America's shield uh, being powered by freedom, actually because of the fact that it's so durable with, you know, being kind of a uh, adamantium iron vibranium alloy, of course the energy signatures basically dissipate and one of them hits Corvus Glaive. And so Corvus Glaive is essentially incinerated in his entirety by an additional attack that comes from Hyperion. Now, this is something to remember about Corvus Glaive. For those of you guys who have seen my recent videos uh, with Marvel Now 2.0 and Thanos Volume 1, right off the bat, you're probably asking yourself the question, if Corvus Glaive is destroyed here, then how did he show up in Marvel Now 2.0? Okay, so Corvus Glaive, if you notice, always carries a staff. So long as that staff is never broken and intact, Corvus Glaive can never truly be destroyed. His essence will live on and he'll just be reconstructed. That's kind of how that works. And so as a result, you suddenly have like what's left of the superheroes facing off against, against Thanos. And that's, that's what's cool because you suddenly have like Thor who jumps into the fray. And it's interesting because like you look at this and you're like, oh yeah, man, Thor, Thor's calling down the lightning because you know, God of Thunder and all that cool stuff. Thor's got this man, right? wrong like thor gets wrecked like it's, it's amazing <laughs> thor gets crushed so bad it's it's hilarious this is thanos we're talking about and just in like a base form no cosmic cube no power stone no infinity gauntlet no none of that stuff he's more than a match for the earth's superheroes and where thor comes riding in high nothing happens like thanos just beats the crap out of him and that's 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 the cool thing to take away from here because the whole time this is taking place the ebony maw is whispering in the ear of thane this is how he works this is how he functions 
functions, duplicity, manipulation. This is how he makes a name for himself. You know, Ebony Maw is looking at Thane and saying, look upon my works and frown because only oblivion waits those who are so foolish as to believe they have a chance to succeed against Thanos. But if someone doesn't step in, they're all going to die. And so this is your opportunity, Thane. This is your chance. Are you going to run from the idea of being the son of Thanos? Are you going to take off from your destiny? Are you going to run and hide in the hills? Or are you going to actually do something? Are you going to become the son of Thanos? And that's exactly what Thane does. He finally steps up and says, yes. And basically uses his hand, uses his, uh, uses his right hand, I think it is, to essentially encase Thanos in living death. To basically encase him in amber. And he'll never be able to escape. Proxima Midnight is in the exact same situation. They're basically stuck here. Now this goes forward into the future of Jonathan Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers and Time Runs Out storyline. And eventually they are free. That's where the cabal of Namor the Submariner comes from. And that's why you see Thanos in the future of Avengers and New Avengers and going into like Secret Wars and the collapse of the multiverse. But that's what this is designed to do. It's designed to basically take the power, you know, take Thanos as a character and put him on the back burner so that Hickman can come back and, and return him and have him continue on in the rest of the Avengers and New Avengers story. From here, it's just kind of like rebuilding, right? It's Captain America and it's Hyperion and Carol Danvers and all these folks basically rebuilding. It's the world coming to grips with the fact that like Inhumans are rising into prominence now. It's the other universes across the cosmos recovering, rebuilding their respective empires and all that kind of good stuff. But for the Illuminati, for Name of the Submariner, for, for Iron Man, for Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four, for Beast, for Black Panther, for Doctor Strange, the collapse of the multiverse continues on. The incursions continue on. And while Thanos has been defeated, he's just one small conflict. The rest of everything is still going to continue on. You're still going to have the collapse of the multiverse. You're still going to have the incursions. Not only that, where they've basically faced off against Thanos in this regard, and they've had to like focus on the idea of presumably facing their own mortality, what they've also got to contend with is other universes now. They've got to contend with the Black Priest, the Ivory Kings, all this stuff that goes into like the collapse of the multiverse and the end of all things. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.